Hello everyone and welcome back to the workshop. What I have here is a Sieg Chinese mini lathe which I've used for over one and a half years. And Chinese mini lathes are a great piece of kit for under a thousand dollars but they do have their odd quirks to do with their quality and design. So in this video I have a few tips that I wish I was told when I first got my lathe and hopefully you will learn something new. So tip number one, if you haven't got your lathe yet, make sure you have a large roll of paper towels and wax and grease remover for when the lathe arrives, because when they ship these lathes from the factory in China, they coat them in a really thick coat of red grease, which you're going to need to remove before you can actually set up your lathe and use it. Tip number two, please bolt your lathe down. Take it from me, someone who didn't do this for a bit. Bolting your lathe down to a workbench is a must do from both a safety and quality of work point of view. First of all, having a lathe which you can easily move around is just a really dangerous practice to do, but bolting your lathe down will add so much more rigidity to the lathe and the difference really does show up in the accuracy and finish of workpieces. Now to do this, use the four M8 threaded holes used for the rubber feet. If you have a lighter workbench, you can mount the lathe on the included rubber feet to dampen vibration, but if you have a heavier workbench like I do, I didn't think this was necessary and I haven't had any issues with vibrations yet. Tip number three, adjust the Gibbs screws. This is probably the biggest thing you can do to improve the accuracy and surface finish of your parts, because in my experience, the Gibbs screws were very poorly set up from the factory. A quick explanation of what we're doing here is this. The cross slide and top slide are essentially a dovetail joint with a screw to slide them backwards and forwards. The dovetail joints aren't the same size to allow for movement. To make sure they don't wobble around too much, a little wedge is placed in the gap and pressure is applied on the wedge by three little gib screws. Loose gib screws will allow movement in the slide, but if they're too loose, the slides can actually wobble around. Now the more pressure you apply using the gibs, the less movement in the slide and thus more rigid the slide is, but if you apply too much pressure, the slide will actually seize up. So to adjust the gib screws, undo the little nuts and use an allen key to add pressure on the wedge. Use the wheel to check if the slide can still move. If it ceased up, back off the pressure, but if you can still wobble around a little bit, add a little bit more pressure. And this is simply a game of adding pressure and backing off until you find the correct amount of pressure that makes the slide rigid, but also allows it to move. And once you have found this sweet spot, finish off by tightening up the nut. Tip number four, the lathe is going to come with a set of acetyl plastic gears used to drive the gearbox which drives the threading screw. These gears have had quality issues in the past, so make sure to check each gear for defects or cracks. Also, whilst the plastic screws are adequate for light use, if you do plan on doing a lot of thread cutting, I would opt to buy a set of metal gears for the lathe, which you can find online. Tip number five, when you aren't needing to cut threads, I recommend that you use the lever on the back of the lathe to disengage the gearbox. It will save wear on the gears and you won't need to waste power turning the gears, saying that takes more power than you would think and less power used on the gearbox is more power to the spindle, saying that you do need on these lathes which aren't exactly famed for the amount of power that they have. And as well as that, if you disengage the gearbox, the lathe will run so much quieter. And also, if you didn't know, the lever on the back is also used to reverse the threading screw to cut both left and right handed threads. Tip number six, depending on what lathe you bought, it will come with either a cam lock or nut and bolt locking tail stock. The nut and bolt locking version seems to be the more common and cheaper version, but be warned if you do a lot of drilling work or a lot of work that requires use of the tail stock, the amount of time that it takes to tighten and untighten the bolt really does add up. So if you're going to use the tail stock a lot, I would recommend you opt to either buy or upgrade to the cam locking version. But if you choose not to, I recommend that you replace the nut that comes with the lathe with a taller one that is as tall as the exposed threads. 
On my original tail stock, these short nuts meant that all the force when tightened up was focused on a few threads and over the course of a year, it actually stripped the threads, which meant that I actually had to replace that component. So I recommend that you either replace the nut with a taller one or make your own that can easily distribute all the force along all the threads. Tip number seven, buy some mild strength thread locking compound. Lathes will generally produce a lot of vibrations, which can vibrate a lot of nuts and bolts, which you might not notice until after you have accidentally vacuumed them up. Don't ask me how I know this. The bolts and nuts that I would glue are the ones on the wheels, underneath the cross slide, which you might need to remove the threading bolt to access. Tip number eight, under the tool post is a little lug used to stop the tool post rotating clockwise past 90 degrees. And it's used on both the standard and on some quick change tool posts. Now every now and then, you want to remove the tool post so you can vacuum underneath it to remove any dust and you might accidentally vacuum up the lug and you'll find yourself looking for it for the next 10 minutes in the vacuum. Once again, don't ask me how I know this, so just be wary of it. And if you're using a tool post that does require this little lug, it is a pretty important piece not to lose. Tip number nine, when you inevitably need to reach for the external jaws so you can cut large pieces of stock, I recommend that you label the jaws as you remove them so you know which one to put back first. Label them in reverse order as to how they come out. So on this chuck, the first jaw that would come out would be number four, and the last one that would come out would be number one, as number one would be the first one that you would put back in. Yes, you can always look at the back of the jaws as the one with the lowest groove will go in first, but doing it this way just saves you a little bit extra time and makes your job a little bit easier. Now tip number 10, this is not 100% necessary, but it may save you some money in the future, and that is to check the control box by removing the front cover by undoing four screws. Simply make sure that all the wires are seated correctly and there aren't any dry solder joints on the control board. And furthermore, if during use, if the RPMs ever surge, look into claiming under warranty for a new control board because it's possible that your one is faulty. With these lays, there actually isn't all that much to go wrong, but something that can easily go wrong are the cheap Chinese electronics. And unfortunately, I got a dud board, which is not exactly uncommon, and if I didn't get it replaced under warranty, I was looking at a replacement cost of between two and $300, which is almost a third of the cost of the lay. And with that, I hope you did learn something from this video. If you have any other tips, please post them in the comments. And with that, thank you very much for watching.